I am Sage Purseau, Director of Education at Fuller Craft Museum in Brockton, Massachusetts, and I'm thrilled to have you all here tonight and our excellent guests who I will introduce short, shortly. Our mission at Fuller Craft is to provide meaningful discovery of contemporary craft through exhibitions, collections, education, and public programs. We're committed to challenging perceptions and building appreciation of the material world. Our purpose is to inspire, stimulate, and enrich an ever-expanding community. To learn more about our collection, exhibitions, other upcoming virtual and not virtual events, um, or becoming a member, please visit us at fullercraft.org. Um, I'm going to begin by introducing artist Michelle Seymour, who will present work from her exhibition, Mapping Borders and Boundaries, uh, and introduce the panelists for our conversation, exploring the relationship between Palestinian and Middle Eastern craft with modern and contemporary art from that region and the Arab diaspora. So Michelle is a multimedia artist whose work explores the intersection between science, technology, and the natural world and the socio-political repercussions of redefining borders and boundaries. Michelle has been a scholar in residence at the Tufts European Center in France, an artist in residence at Haystack Mountain School of Crafts in Maine, the Banff Center Canada, and P-R-I-N-T Press in Denton, Texas. Her exhibitions include the Decor of a Sculpture Park and Museum in Lincoln, Mass, the Museum of Modern Art in Strasbourg, France, the Color Art Center in Wisconsin, Houston Center for Contemporary Craft, the Racine Art Museum, Fitchburg Art Museum, and of course, Fuller Craft Museum. She's received grants from the Massachusetts Cultural Council, including a 2014 Fellowship in Drawing, a Society of Arts and Crafts New England Artist Award, and grants from the Cushman Family Fund, the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, and the Daynard Fund to study historic papermaking in France and Japan. Her work has been featured in surface design, fiber arts, and hand papermaking magazines, and is included in public and private collections, including the, the Cordova Sculpture Park and Museum, International Paper Company, and the Meditech Corporation. Michelle Seymour resides in North Bennington, Vermont, and is a professor of the practice at the School of the Museum of Fine Arts at Tufts University, where she teaches historical and contemporary approaches to working with handmade paper and pulp. And we are so excited to have you here, Michelle. Um, thanks for joining us. Thanks for sharing your work and all of this really great conversation with us tonight. Can you please um, get us started? Thank you, Sage. I appreciate that. Uh, so I want to thank additionally uh, Beth McLaughlin and the Fuller Craft Museum for this opportunity to exhibit um, this series of work, as well as Deborah Weisberg, May Farhat, and Pamela uh, Karimi, who connected me with these three panelists who I've had the honor of working with and crafting uh, tonight's conversation. Deanna Abuali, Jessica Gershultz, and Nisa Ari. Uh, so some introductions. Um, Diana Abu Ali is the director of the Arab American National Museum in Dearborn, Michigan. Her career has straddled higher education, cultural heritage, and museum work. She's held a number of positions, including assistant professor in the Department of Asian and Middle Eastern Languages and Literatures, now Middle Eastern Studies at Dartmouth College, head of research and collections at the Palestinian Museum, in Berzeat, uh, Palestine, and Director of Education, Outreach, and Awareness at the Petra National Trust in Amman, Jordan. She serves on several boards and committees, including Art East in New York City, the Citizens Advisory Committee at the University of Michigan, Dearborn, and the General Assembly of Taiwan Welfare Association in Palestine. Deanna graduated from Wellesley College and received her PhD um, and uh, in history and Middle Eastern studies from Harvard University. Uh, Jessica Gershultz is an uh, associate professor in the Department of African and African American Studies at the University of Kansas. Her research spans modern gender, uh, modern art, gender, and craft, and feminist art histories and methodologies. Jessica was an American Council of Learned Societies Fellow in 2016 for the writing of her first book. Decorative Arts of the Tunisian Ecole, Fabrications of Modernism, Gender, and Power. Her current book project, Fiber Art Constellations, traces trans-regional networks of artists across sites in the Arab world, Africa, 
in former Soviet bloc countries to offer a feminist history of modernist tapestry. Jessica has published articles and chapters in Under the Skin, Feminist Art and Art Histories from the Middle East and North Africa, the Journal of Modern Craft in 2020, the Art Salon in the Arab region, um, Art Margins uh, 2016, the International Journal of Islamic Architecture and Critical Inventions, the Journal of African Art History and Visual Culture uh, 2014. She was a subject uh, advisor for the MoMA Anthology, Modern Art in the Arab World, Primary Documents, and has published essays and exhibition catalogs, in, uh, including um, Georgie Pluriel, edited by Nadia Jalassi in 2018. She served on the board of AMCA, which is the Association of Modern and Contemporary Art of the Arab World, Iran and Turkey since 2015. Jessica received her PhD in art history from Emory University. And Nisa Ari. Uh, Nisa Ari is lecturer in art history at the Catherine G. McGovern College of the Arts and a faculty affiliate with the Center for Arab Studies at the University of Houston. She studies late 19th um, and 20th century visual practices with a focus on artwork from the Middle East. Her research explores the relationships between cultural politics and the development of art institutions, specifically in Palestine and in Turkey. Her current book project, Cultural Mandates, Artistic Missions and the Welfare of Palestine, 1876 to 1948, explores how radical political transformations from the last decades of Ottoman rule until the establishment of the State of Israel changed the nature of artistic production in Palestine. Her research has been published in Third Text, Arab Studies Journal, and Thresh Thresholds, and she has recently curated ex exhibitions at the uh, Kalandia International Art Biennial, uh, Jerusalem and Ramallah, and the Keller Gallery at MIT. Um, she received her PhD in the History, Theory, and Criticism of Art and Architecture program at MIT. So uh, before beginning um, our panel, we want to acknowledge and condemn the recent fighting between the Israeli military and Hamas militants in Gaza, which killed nearly 250 people and escalated the devastating humanitarian crisis in Gaza and which was fueled once again by Israeli assaults on Palestinians, including at the Alaska Mosque, and on ongoing disputes over land rights, most recently Israel's effort to expel Palestinian families from the Sheikh Zara uh, Silwan neighborhoods in East Jerusalem. We also want to acknowledge and condemn the raid by Israeli occupational forces of the Dar Yusuf Nasri uh, Jasir for Art and Research, the beloved and respected grassroots independent artist run initiative founded in Bethlehem in 2014. Team members and resident artists are safe, but there was extensive damage throughout the historic 19th century building. They also lost their urban farm when it was burnt to the ground during several fires surrounding the house. Uh, I will be putting a link in the chat for all of you if you're interested in learning more uh, about them. So thank you all for being here and I'm going to start uh, sharing my screen and um, show you the work that I have in the exhibition and then we'll move on to a conversation with our panelists. So Bethlehem about 1924 which is where uh, my family uh, is from. My grandparents um, were born in Bethlehem. And I'm gonna show you um, some of the objects that I grew up with and that have influenced the work that I'm gonna show you. So this is our, uh, a large family rug that was in our living room. And, you know, as a kid just playing on this rug, um, uh, becoming very intimate with it, uh, moving uh, toys throughout it, um, whether it was playing with my brothers or um, by myself, but um, it just was very much a part of our family and sort of ingrained in my memory. Uh, this object, um, it's a vest, it had sleeves originally, it belonged to my grandmother and um, 
we um, turned it in, my other grandmother turned it into a vest and you can see this beautiful cooching um, with this metallic thread that was very typical of um, the um, needlework that was done in Palestine, uh, in uh, Bethlehem at that time. And then um, this hinged um, uh, makeup compact that's about th uh, two inches in diameter, it's very small. Um, it is typical of the mother of pearl work that was um, uh, ubiquitous to uh, Bethlehem. Um, this uh, way of working was brought to uh, the area by the Franciscans. And you can, here's an image uh, with some men cutting uh, the mother of pearl. I don't, don't know how well you can see it, but behind the mother of pearl, there's um, a, a green tinted metallic um, sheet of um, uh, foil. And this is also very typical of that work. Here's a um, jewelry box that was my mother, uh, mother's gifted uh, to her by my um, by her mother-in-law, um, and uh, it's uh, wood with mother of pearl uh, and abalone shells, and then lined with fabric. Um, this is the New Testament of my father's. Um, again, mother of pearl um, and abalone and. Uh, on the, the image on the right, you can see this, the, the, uh, the remnants of metal that was painted red and um, uh, sort of a turquoise here. And the mother of pearl would have been cut and overlaid on the metallic here uh, with the metallic color coming through. You can see it better here in the red uh, coming through this image. So land loss uh, since 1917. Um, I have been using um, the cartography of Palestine um, and um, its changes um, over the years to, to tell the story of the Palestinian uh, um, diaspora and also just the, um, the Palestinians themselves, those who were still um, um, sort of landlocked uh, within Israel and within their own uh, borders and those who are refugees um, as well. So what I've done is I've taken the map, um, uh, various maps, and I've outlined the landforms and I've mirrored them. You can see my cursor. So um, this is what happens. Israel mirrored um, uh, West Bank, uh, the, a proposed version of Gaza, uh, and I've also done Gaza itself, uh, actual Gaza, Jerusalem, and so on. And also the negative shapes here that result from the mirroring. So for instance, the shape is a shape that I would use this one and so on. So all of the images that I am working with and are uh, derived from this reconfiguration of these land masses. This is an image of some of the work when it was in my studio. And this is how it looks in, um, the, um, in the museum. These pieces are all reverse painting on plexiglass. So I, I paint on the back side of plexi and I, um, with translucent paint and opaque paint, and I back the, paint, the, the plexi from behind with crumpled foil which gives it this metallic look. So when I started working this way, I mean, I had been thinking for quite a while about how I wanted to uh, talk about um, my Palestinian ancestry, um, also as a way of honoring my, my father. And um, I wanted it to come from a, um, a very honest and personal um, story. So I had been working uh, for quite a while with a reverse painting on glass this way um, using biologic um, forms. And when I remembered that the mother of pearl was backed with uh, foil, uh, I was very excited about that because it was a way into um, to telling the story and using a method that I was familiar with. Um, when I'm working, I um, 
also make small um, sketches of the pieces and do color tests. So that's just to give you an idea of how I approach it. And then um, this is another one. This was actually the first one that I had done. So that's Palestine and Israel, you can see here mirrored and we've got um, Gaza on the border. And this should give you, I hope, a, a better idea of what that foil does behind it. This paint here is opaque, and this is translucent paint, again, painted from the backside. This piece is, it's the same piece in different lights. I end up using some um, uh, metallic and pearlescent paints as well. So uh, depending upon uh, how the pieces are lit and where you're standing in front of the piece, the, the work changes. And I liked that shift in the work because again, I'm dealing with um, landforms that have been shifted, uh, that have been redefined. And um, the idea of the light changing, continuing to change uh, what, uh, and that, that whole idea of something being static and having the potential to move, um, it has been of interest to me in all of this work. Uh, this is the um, one, uh, one of the settlements. What I found interesting in um, tracing some of the settlements uh, is that the forms became more biologic and that they, they feel to me like they're, they're moving. They're not as geometric. And of course, with more and more settlements being built, that seemed to be an apt association with this um, relationship between this more amorphic form and the growth of uh, the settlements. Then I went on to um, sort of, I morphed these designs a little bit and made, um, I used uh, mother of pearl acrylic. I laser cut it. Uh, these are uh, smaller than the, the first paintings. They're 24 inches by 15 and they have some depth. They're almost an inch thick. Um, so I've cut out uh, the shapes and instead of backing it with colored foil, because I felt like the, the, um, the mother of pearl has a beautiful sheen to it and is very luscious, I wanted to, um, I, I didn't want it to be overly decorative. So I burnt wood and I mounted the mother of pearl on top of the, of the burnt wood to again, um, try to tell this, this story. And then, um, I was fortunate to receive a, um, a grant uh, from uh, the Haystack Mountain School of Crafts uh, to, uh, to work for two weeks. Um, uh, it was a residency and the idea was uh, in this residency that artists could, uh, can explore and work with materials that they haven't worked with for a while. They, the um, facilities are open um, so that you can move through different media. I wanted to work in the wood shop and I thought that it was that I, I wanted to do something that felt more visceral and I was thinking about those jewelry boxes um, in the, in the um, New Testament that I showed you where the mother of pearl was falling off of the wood and exposing the wood. So I wanted to incorporate wood somehow in this work and um, also talk about this idea of loss and erasure and to tell a story. So I consider these um, as pages, as tablets. Um, and uh, the idea of uh, milk and honey, uh, the, uh, there was a term frequently used um, uh, as uh, Israel was being developed, you know, the promised land, the land of milk and honey. And um, I, uh, of course, am asking the question, who's land of milk and honey is it and how sweet is it actually and so it was important um, for me to use materials um, that you know every material has meaning so I've been used I've, in this piece I'm using beeswax uh, white paint um, and and white plaster and of course the wood this these tablets have been painted and sanded um, and I started the piece actually by drilling holes into wood and burning the wood. And then I saved uh, all the wood that resulted, all the scraps of wood, um, so that there's this kind of closed system, uh, which is how I perceive the Palestinians. Um, 
a living where, you know, living is difficult and leaving can be just as difficult. So um, these shards of wood are embedded in the uh, mother of pearl, uh, mother, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, in the beeswax and the um, holes drilled in the wood and mud, uh, the beeswax poured in. Um, the pouring of the plaster, um, also the idea of plaster now, unfortunately, I mean, if you see the images of Gaza, you can just see the rubble. Uh, and then the wood embedded, uh, scraps of wood embedded into the, the plaster and the plaster burned again. And then this piece, which is again, the sawdust from all of that, uh, uh, the work um, just compressed. And the last piece I'm going to show you um, is called Milk and Honey Stuck. Uh, I have been working with paper for um, over 40 years and uh, teaching paper making um, to wonderful students at the School of the Museum of Fine Arts uh, at Tufts. And I uh, usually work with paper in one form or another um, in all of the work that I'm doing. So in this case, I took some pulp, or it's a, a plant matter, ab abaca, which I um, pulverized so it looks like very fine paste, and I pigmented it the color of honey, and I, or the colors of honey, uh, and then I had the um, various land masses and negative shapes cut again from mother of pearl and embedded them in the wet sheet of paper as I was forming it, so you can see them here and so on. And, and when the um, paper was uh, dried, I then went back in with gouache. And what's happening here with the movement of the paper is that the paper pulp is very high shrinkage and it shrinks tight up against this, uh, the static um, uh, forms, uh, the central form, creating uh, that kind of movement um, of the paper. And again, for me, it was an idea, the idea was uh, this uh, something that's static, something that is um, stationary or expected, and then something has that has the potential to move a border that can be re um, redrawn, redefined, uh, but uh, a people who are still stuck um, and unable to move. Um, and the idea of using the biologic sort of imagery, you know, just talking about um, uh, habitat fragmentation or um, flagella, you know, the means of movement for microscopic organisms, uh, plant metamorphosis, cell division, and so on. They're just some of the, the visual um, vocabulary um, that I was suggesting. Um, and what I see is this uh, re-examination of land as a malleable, movable, um, biologic, um, and political construct. So that's all I have to show. I'm going to stop sharing, and I'm going to ask um, Jessica to, to take over. Thank you so much, Michelle, and thank you, everybody, for being here today. Um, Michelle, we're so thrilled to be able to view this body of work with you. Um, your insight into your artistic practice and your approaches um, open up so many pathways for conversation. And I'm really thrilled to kind of help us um, help guide our conversation um, tonight. So um, let's first turn to one of the broader themes that's embedded in your work, um, which is the relationship between craft and identity. Um, so I'd like to start us off tonight with um, a few words about this issue in the Arab world um, to offer some general context um, before we turn specifically to Palestine and the diaspora, which um, Diana and uh, Nisa will be addressing. So um, just a kind of a few words in, um, for a general background. Um, historically, craft roles in the region were gendered. And this means basically that the division of artistic production was often determined by an artist's gender as male or female. Agricultural work and artistry were often performed by the same individual at different times of the year. Embroidery and the weaving of rugs were usually, although not exclusively, in the domain of women, 
uh, both in rural areas and in cities that were noted for their rich textile histories, such as um, Kaidouan in Tunisia. And women's artistry was generally passed through generations and within extended families. So the close association between women and fiber arts assumed in the um, early um, 20th century, actually back into the 19th century, early 20th century, in the region, it assumed new dimensions um, with the intensification of colonial rule and sort of the lens of the quote unquote civilizing mission. And the status of women and craftspeople as representative or somehow symbolic of a laboring population made them prime targets for colonial projects of disempowerment that were often framed as protecting women and their art, um, which was seen as a, a lucrative industry. So when we look at this period, um, we really should kind of play critical, pay critical attention to the use of the term craft. Um, which became both a feminized and a racialized concept that could have pejorative connotations at times. Women's rugs and embroidery were likewise central to post-colonial projects of social uplift. So to many mid-century artists and intellectuals, um, for example, in North Africa, the Ecole de Casablanca in Morocco, the Ecole de Tunis in Tunisia, the Wissa Wasif School outside of Cairo, could go on and on. Um, women's fiber arts carried strong metaphoric power for the expression of cultural identity and for a return to origins. And it also served as a mode of resistance to colonial dominance and false notions of European cultural superiority. So modern and contemporary artists have turned and they continue to turn to sort of the materials and to the processes of fiber and the iconography of textiles to be able to produce like a vast range of social and political commentary, uh, both over overtly as well as subversively. Um, and so I'd like to ask Nisa um, if she would please kind of elaborate on the relationship between craft and identity in Palestine specifically. I'd be happy to. I'm, I again, I'm just so thrilled for this opportunity um, to come here today to talk about Michelle's work and about um, craft in the Arab world and specifically Palestine. This is a real treat. Um, it, I, it's interesting listening to your comments, Jessica, because I was thinking about um, when in my own research, when I talk about craft in Palestine, I actually start in the period kind of prior to colonial um, intrusion in Palestine, which I think of as particularly happening with the start of British military control, later followed by the mandate um, right after World War I, um, as well as we could talk about Zionist settler colonial initiatives as well. Um, but what's interesting in the case of Palestine is that the kind of revolution in craft um, occurs a bit earlier, starting in the 1870s, um, when kind of owing to changes in Ottoman laws, um, which allowed for a lot more increased trade and travel to the Ottoman world and particularly to Palestine, where we had a lot of very eager Holy Land tourists and religious pilgrims, we really see a rise in um, crafts, especially the selling of Palestinian crafts um, to occur around that time, um, starting in about 1870. So there's this real up surge that happens at that point, which then kind of sets the stage for what happens later in the early 20th century. Um, but what I found particularly compelling when thinking about crafts in Palestine at the kind of, at, you know, this turn of the century period is that it's so experimental. <laughs> um, and this is precisely because there's, you know, stiff competition um, in this very robust uh, souvenir market that's happening, especially in Jerusalem. So we have artists that are really experimenting across media, um, trying to um, find kind of inroads for what people are going to like in this market. So it was exciting to see Michelle's work because that resonated so deeply with my historical research into this um, late 19th and early 20th century period where artists are um, look, you know, a mother of pearl artist is looking at the work of a painter and trying to um, put some of those designs into mother of pearl. We're seeing the same thing happen in 
woodwork, um, also as photography is on the rise um, in this late 19th century period, we see a lot of exchange between photography and painting and wood inlay. Um, and so it's just, it's a highly experimental period and it's really non-hierarchical as well, which was, I think, um, fascinating to really allow that to set in as I was doing research, just how much these different crafts were really on equal footing in Palestine. And I think in a, in a lot of ways they've remained so because of this being the heritage of contemporary Palestinian artists who are both working within Palestine or in the diaspora today. Um, so I very much see a lot of what Michelle's doing as, as being in conversation with this kind of late 19th century craft revolution in Palestine that I, I think has really, um, it's, it's very much formed the basis for a lot of what we see in contemporary art today. And, um, and I think it's kind of unique, um, unique to Palestine as well. I, I also want to thank uh, everyone um, and especially Michelle for, for the, for being on the panel for putting, getting us all together and to talk about Michelle's wonderful work and the, the themes that sort of emanate from it. Um, not much to add to what Nisa said um, and, and maybe just talk about craft in Palestine and, and more, or, um, you know, more recent times um, and to think about, mostly about embroidery, which is like what Jessica was saying was really, you know, a feminine, you know, kind of, um, uh, craft or handiworks, things that, you know, women, Palestinian women, and especially rural women and, and Bedouin women, not so much um, urban women in terms of the way that embroidery was used in the 19th century, early 20th century to adorn the clothing that one, uh, one wore. Um, but it also has become um, sort of a symbol of Palestinian national identity, uh, the embroidered dress, different, several motifs, uh, different kind of motifs, um, the cross stitch, um, has become not only, like I said, a national form of national identity, but it's it's become politicized, but also commodified as well. It's become a commodity that you know um, Palestinian women produce and, and many Palestinian women purchase. Um, so it's also sort of entered a kind of um, trajectory of its own. And and um, but I think there's also a lot of artists in the diaspora and and, and also in Palestine who who use the embroidery, the craft, so to speak, um, as a form of artistic expression. Um, and, and some of them are not women, by the way. I mean, there are many of them who are women, but there are some men. Uh, Joseph uh, Nasser comes to, uh, Jordan Nasser comes to mind and, and Omar uh, Nasser Khouri. These are two Palestinian men who, you know, use embroidery, use this sort of heritage to create, especially for Jordan Nasser, these, these landscapes that are, are completely not, in terms of if images and visuals, not unlike, not like anything that's traditional, but a very, you know, modern contemporary interpretation of it. Um, so I, I, I very much see Michelle's work using these kind of more traditional um, materials, uh, objects, and sort of reinterpreting them in a political, with a political statement, and and which is something that all, a lot of these artists do and, and use craft for that for that reason for that purpose. Just to to add to that, I think. Um... What's kind of fascinating from the early history onward is that there's always this concurrent um, mobilization of craft in Palestine, both for kind of economic stimulation and also to go along with kind of humanitarian uplift that's already starting to happen in the late 19th century. At the same time as it's very much being used as a realm for experimentation, aesthetic experimentation, as well as political um, resistance even, we start to see that pretty early on and you know another kind of element of the early um, early kind of craft traditions in Palestine early I'm talking late 19th century not the early early <laughs> which we could go way back um, but is that it's also you know in Palestine there's such a big kind of missionary push to increase craft production uh, among Palestinians um, which you know in many ways is related to what Jessica was talking about with co colonial interest in the crafts um, later on, or we might see that as a precursor to it. So, I mean, Michelle noted the mother of pearl tradition is kind of brought to Palestine by the Franciscans as early as the 13th century, but it really falls, there's kind of, it um, ebbs and flows in terms of how much it's practiced over time. 
Um, but then again, sees a large spike in the late 19th century to kind of cater to it, this new public, um, but also to try and, you know, there's a lot of, of kind of language around it that's very uh, quote unquote benevolent of, you know, if we kind of give, allow these people to practice the craft in a more um, robust way, then they'll be able to make a living from this craft. You know, we'll have economic stimulation in Palestine in a way that hasn't been there before. Um, and we still see a lot of these um, kind of nonprofit initiatives that have uh, continued in Palestine from the early 20th century uh, through the Nakba to today. Um, so there's kind of that resonance to do with Palestinian craft, again, at the same time as it's this, um, you know, a deeply um, localized tradition um, for indigenous, you know, an indigenous practice that has really survived over time and often in resistance to some of these other initiatives, um, even by missionary institutions, by humanitarian institutions, today by NGOs as well. So I think, yeah, there's kind of many ways at which we can, can talk about really how Palestinian craft has been mobilized and, and utilized over time. Thank you. So let's kind of turn to thinking about craft and rural culture and the land. So again, craft and agricultural production were, and in some cases remain closely related and seasonally cyclical. And artisans worked the land and they drew from their knowledge of raw materials and plants and trees and insects and animals, which embedded the land's cosmological and spiritual significance into artistic materials and processes. So in Palestine, the um, religious and spiritual power of the land and the soil, um, bodies of water, um, led to the development of specific aesthetic practices and the demarcations of boundaries of sort of around sacred spaces. And then um, something else we've kind of talked about in some of our conversations have been the translation of plant matter and local ecologies into embroidery and into print matter. And so, um, you know, Nisa, maybe you could um, elaborate for us some of these connections between art and then scientific, religious, and geographic expeditions, um, you know, maybe particularly around the practice of so-called biblical botany and the production of these um, pressed flower books that you've been looking at. Yes. <laughs> I couldn't, couldn't resist sharing some of this material in relation to Paul's work. Mm -hmm. um, but also just in what in these opening um, comments in this question, Jessica, you I think framed it so nicely about this very particular relationship between Palestine and its kind of natural specimens as being not just evocative of a certain kind of rootedness of a people, but this very sacred element as well. So there's a, a great essay by WJT Mitchell called uh, Holy Landscape, and he kind of makes the argument that for many people in Palestine, kind of religious or otherwise, there's often this idea that not just certain sites in Palestine are sacred, but really the whole of Palestine and the ground is kind of seen as almost a holy icon, um, all of it. <laughs> and so again, in terms of the kind of ways in which um, the craft industries take this up is not just by making objects that are evocative of the landscape or kind of illustrate Palestine, the landscape, but in fact um, are really eager to use natural elements from the landscape, you know, drawing from the land itself to convey that kind of sacred quality of the work. Um, yeah, so uh, um, we're pulling up some images here I've, uh, because I've been starting to look um, at this practice uh, that starts in the 19th century called um, biblical botany, um, not a term that's used much today, but it was in a little bit in, that term was in circulation in the late 19th century. And it really was a, essentially a, a kind of scriptural scientific field, a hybrid scriptural scientific field to index and taxonomize um, the flora and fauna of Palestine, kind of as a way, I would say, um, for many of its earliest practitioners to, to figure out new ways to kind of unlock the Bible. For instance, 
you know, in the Bible, the lilies of the field are mentioned, but nobody knows exactly what is, which flower is meant by lilies of the fields, the anemone or the iris or, um, and so you had really robust kind of interdisciplinary conversations happening around uh, these questions. And I think maybe I have a slide, two slides earlier, if we could go to show uh, the other direction, I believe. Um, just to show these kind of massive handbooks that start to be produced mostly by missionaries and um, or wives or daughters of missionaries um, in Palestine who are really eager to kind of see the Bible through its botanical and plant specimens. Um, and then this also gets translated into the souvenir industry that I was talking about earlier. So if we could go to the next slide. Yeah, these are the um, covers of some of these very popular pressed flower souvenir booklets, which really show off Palestinian craft in all its variety from, you know, wood, olive wood carved um, frontispieces, pieces or sometimes with wood inlay or hand painted, um, sometimes leather bound. And then on the interiors, when you open them up, this was the slide we had up earlier. Um, you see these arrangements of pressed and dried flowers. Um, which sometimes they have these titles of where they're from in the region. You know, this page is, you know, flowers from Mount Zion, flowers from Mount Moriah, flowers from Bethlehem. Um, although if you look closely, pretty much the flowers look all the same <laughs> from wherever yeah. they're supposed to be from. Um, so they're playing it fast and loose um, with them. <laughs> But they are, uh, I, I, as I've been looking at more of these, I do think they often try to evoke some biblical narratives. Um, for instance, the one on the left there, the bottom left is, is supposed to be flowers from Mount Moriah, the site where um, Abraham was to sacrifice Isaac. And at least uh, when I look at that, I kind of see a anthropomorphizing going on of this kind of maybe sacrificial body of Isaac laying at the bottom there over this towering figure of maybe of Abraham, his father. Um, so there was, again, this, this kind of experimentation that's happening in the souvenir industry. But as I was kind of trying to mention earlier, um, there's like the commercial aspect of these crafts, but it also starts to bleed into more um, political, cultural projects as well. Um, so in the next slide, um, I have a photograph for you um, taken from the Betzalel School of Arts and Crafts, which was the first Zionist art school in Palestine. The Betzalel's founder, Boris Schatz, um, seemed to be keenly aware of the need to, or in his kind of search for a new, what he called Hebrew art um, for Palestine, for Jews immigrating to Palestine as part of the Zionist movement. He recognized that they needed to kind of connect with the land to create a new visual vocabulary for this new art. Um, and so instituted classes in plant drawing very early on in the first year of the school's founding, he even founded a department of botany as part of the school. And, and here you see students um, looking at some plants, some live plants, but also if you look in the, the background, you see some of their studies up on the wall there, including even on the right, um, some experimenting with Hebrew typography using plant forms. So this idea that the land and kind of mobilizing of the land or by uh, Palestine's agricultural and biological specimens into art could be part of national and kind of political projects is, is happening here in, in 1906 um, at the Betzalel School. It's also happening um, in uh, schools which are predominantly attended by Palestinian students. Um, I have one more slide, I think they wrap up here. Um, uh, these are not uh, school kids, but it is a, a nice photograph. So I thought it would be illustrative of my point, but um, Palestinians too are, are very um, fond of going to um, the hills of Palestine to pick wildflowers, especially during the spring. And we also see in kind of school records, this encouragement um, by teachers uh, to have Palestinians kind of connect with the land through this activity of wildflower picking, connect it to their identity as Palestinians. So we're seeing these projects happen really early on and it, I find it just, I, I found it, yeah, again, so compelling to look at Michelle's work and, and to see how her 
very personal exploration or kind of way into this question of identity and land politics um, and botany and biology even is kind of mirrored in this early 20th century moment. Um, and that's kind of found its way um, to her and to her work. Um, but I think very keenly kind of through objects like from the, you know, objects like that rug from the early 20th century, which you know, are part of this history and have made their way um, to you as well, Michelle. Yeah, can I just add, I was so excited when you um, shared that with us when we were meeting uh, biblical, you know, this notion of biblical botany. I'd never heard of it. And I'd been thinking quite a bit, obviously, about the relationship of the natural world and using um, that kind of iconography in my work to talk about land movement and, um, and the Palestinian story. So I was just thrilled to, to see that. Well, I also, I mean, I've been learning from you these new terms as well, like habitat fragmentation. Um, right. <laughs> you brought up earlier, right, this idea that, you know, geographic fragmentation affects biological diversity. And it's made me also, I mean, cons like those flower books where there's kind of no regard for where the flowers have really come from. Yeah. But, are now made to serve a very kind of particular religious narrative. I think there's that's kind of a new way to think about what was happening uh, in this early 20th century moment too, kind of through your lens. I love that image too that um, you showed of the um, so the uh, Betzalel. 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 Um, the the geometry on the wall of the, um, the cross stitching and then the um, the plants the plant illustrations um, you know just this you know I think a lot about um, the structure in my work too um, even the last piece that I showed milk and honey stuck where you know thinking about mapping and longitude and latitude and organization and then the the um, biologic form and its potential to move against the grid and through the grid and so whether it's the embroidery um, or the, um, the chest panels, the formality of the chest panel and the organic shapes that move through that, uh, to, through those, or uh, the rugs uh, that can appear to be very organic, but they're very structured at the same time. I think there are so many parallels. Oh, absolutely. This tension between the biomorphic and the, and the structured, which, I mean, now that I'm thinking exactly. of, of it too, is also such a kind of art nouveau. Um, yes, very much, yeah which a lot of the, the Zionist artists who are coming to Palestine are kind of steeped in that tradition. And you, I think, see it in, in those forms as well. So they're applying it to what they're doing in Palestine. And, and, I, and very keenly, you know, and at the expense, I think of, you know, it's very clear what they're trying to do in terms of kind of taking that vocabulary of Palestine's plant specimens and really making it their own. Um, exactly. There are consequences of that, yeah. Well, let's turn to textiles and embroidery as um, often women's art forms um, historically created in the home um, with domestic uses that generate familial associations. And Michelle shared um, some of the works in her home with us. Um, your series, you know, incorporating these textile motifs um, was inspired by the conversation with your father in which you asked him, where is Palestine? Um, so we can connect you know, this sort of um, searching childhood curiosity to these objects and items that are representative of a homeland. And um, you know, I've often thought about the intimacy of cloth and clothing sort of being worn on the body as deepening its power for individual expression but it also sort of makes visible negotiations of cultural and political power. And um, Diana was going to share with us some other works um, of women's embroidered garments in Palestine and kind of telling us more about some of this history. Just to talk a bit about embroidered dresses in, in Palestine, like I said, these were, um, uh, Palestine is a very sort of rich, um, uh, tradition of, of diverse um, embroidery, um, embroidered dresses worn by rural women and, and Bedouin women. Um, and, uh, you know, they were um, 
basically done at the home at before 1948, let's say. Um, you know, most girls were, were trained to do embroidery. Um, it was something that they were expected to learn to sort of create their trousseau that they would sort of um, slowly build over the years that they would then have once they got they got married. Um, and you know, um, these the embroidery was either done in, in cross stitch, so the sort of X. Um, but then we have different styles like couching that, that Michelle um, showed in that vest, which is a sort of, uh, you take a kind of a, a thick thread and you're sort of creating these floral motifs with it. Um, like I said, there's a lot of diversity and um, the, you know, Palestine, the, the, and the dress reflected not just sort of geographic uh, location. So these women, while looking at the dress, you could see whether they were from you know, a certain region in Palestine, the north, the central part, down in the south, in, in, you know, Hebron or Gaza. And not only could you tell regionally where the person was from, but also sometimes even the village where they came from. Um, and so with that, that sort of, um, not only was it sort of, you could identify geographically where the person was from, but also, you know, things like social class, whether the person, the, the woman's family was wealthy. Um, for instance, if, if they were wearing a very kind of, um, you know, dark, uh, the cloth that they use this open weave was was dyed very dark, meant that they dyed it using indigo, which is a very expensive um, dye to purchase. And uh, also sometimes you could tell social, you know, um, they're, um, whether they're the women are married or single um, or even widowed. So there's a lot of sort of, a, a, lot of, a lot of things can be communicated through the dress by reading the dress. Um, this sort of, variety and diversity kind of ends after 1948. Um, and that's because obviously with the Nakba and the dis, you know, displacement of the majority of Palestinians from their lands, from their villages, from their homes, and kind of they're forced to live in refugee camps, whether in Gaza, which was administered by Egypt and in, in the West Bank administered, you know, annexed by Jordan, Lebanon, or even inside Jordan itself on the East Bank. They were sort of removed from their milieu and kind of put in, you know, quarters with other women from different villages, from different regions, and not don't even have access to the materials that they might have used as well to create their dresses. So what comes out of this is a shift away from these dresses that are very, you know, very specific to something that Wida Qawad, who is arguably the greatest collector of Palestinian dress, she calls the camp dress. So these dresses suddenly change to being not from like Hebron or from the Galilee or whatever, but becoming Palestinian. So they're Palestinian um, from everywhere and nowhere at the same time. So it becomes a pastiche of different motifs and, and different um, designs and, and um, what have you. So these are two typical kind of, one is on Ramallah dress on the left, on the right is from Hebron. So you can see the variety of different colors, backgrounds, what have you. And if we go back um, up to 45, 48, what we eventually see happening, so this is a Bethlehem dress, uh, similar to what Michelle, um, her parents had, her ancestors had, if we go up a bit more. It's similar to what Nisa was talking about, that um, it becomes, there is a, there's a transition where not only does, you know, the dress become sort of uh, non, you know, unspecific, but also it, it, you know, there are all these sort of, embroidery becomes a sort of way for, to provide humanitarian assistance, and also becomes a sort of, um, a way of, of showing political identity for the Palestinian becomes emblematic of, of the Palestinian struggle for, for liberation. Um, what, hap what we see also happening is it becomes a kind of statement piece. Um, and this is, these are dresses, um, this one, um, it, this is a dress that was made during the first Intifada 19, in the late 1980s. Um, so on, at that point, you could not sort of uh, not just, you know, right, say Palestine, you couldn't show the colors of the Palestinian flag, you could be arrested. Um, the Intifada was a popular uprising. Um, and uh, sort of, you know, they were, you know, rock throwing youth and, and uh, you know, everybody sort of came in and, and got down in the streets and, and fight the, the Israeli uh, army that were there. So in order to sort of circumvent this prohibition against um, having the color, having the Palestinian flag shown, these women started embroidering in their dresses the symbols of Palestine, whether it's the flag, whether it's the colors of red, black, and green, whether it's the word Palestine, the map of Palestine, um, these sort of, you know, um, chants like written up here, you can see there's, there's sort of language, you know, embroidered uh, script, which is, you don't see, to, you know, at all, you know, in, in traditional um, embroidered dresses. 
And so it itself becomes a sort of statement and, and, and the dress becomes a canvas on which they can, you know, not just circumvent these sort of laws, but also, exp, you know, ex use it as a political statement. So, um, so this is, yeah, an intifada dress. Um, and then the other dress that, so the, the, the dress continues even after the intifada to be a sort of site for political um, action or statements. Um, so this is a dress that was made by a Palestinian woman living in the United States in the 1990s. And if you, you, you can see that she has the flag, you know, embell embellishes, the flags embellish the dress all over. They're sort of, um, you know, again, sort of expecting symbols of Palestine, the Dome of the Rock is one. Um, and, and this was, you know, we see kind of embroidery used in this way. This is not, a t again, doesn't represent any region, but it does represent the fact that whoever's wearing it is obviously Palestinian. Yeah, so this is, a, so it's, it's a sort of interesting kind of development of the dress. And I should say that even though, and that, as I said, you know, traditionally, historically, it's rural women who are wearing these dresses, city women in Palestine, especially before 1948, and the up until the early 20th century, would not wear these kind of dresses. They wore, you know, if they, during Ottoman period, they would wear Ottoman, you know, fashions. Um, slowly in the 1920s and 30s, we hear about workshops where uh, embroiderers are brought to embroider, you know, Western dress. Um, but again, you know, it's, it's very different. But now a lot of women, Palestinian women, will wear these kind of dresses. Um, city women, wealthy women, you know, so it's, it's kind of moved not just in terms of who's making it, but also who's, who's wearing it as well. So sorry, that was a long kind of uh, explanation. I love how you were talking about these dresses as these particular dresses as being from everywhere and nowhere at the same time, because that reminded me of Michelle's work, um, especially the, the mother of pearl panels that are derived out of these very specific land forms that you've been tracing um, and then making symmetrical and kind of embedding into the work in a way that also requires us, uh, maybe requires us to read them, but also is maybe kind of meant to be a little bit opaque, right? Like unless you're kind of given the key to know that this land form is, is Gaza or this one is the West Bank mirrored, um, you don't know exactly. So there's kind of this, I, I don't know, just, just hearing Deanna talk about the intifada dresses made me kind of rethink about those works, Michelle, about how um, they're both very connected specifically to Palestinian land at the same time as they're kind of asking us not to, to see such direct connections or kind of allowing us to enjoy that opacity a little bit. I don't know if that was part of the intent there, but certainly I'm- it's, it's, Yeah, it's very much part of the intent. It's just to draw the viewer in to something yeah. that hopefully is, appears just to be decorative, but that is quite subversive. Uh, and that there's a story behind it. Like, you know, when I, the, the pieces on the plexiglass, there's a story behind the glass, you know, um, that's untouchable, but it's there, so. And, but also I, I so appreciate um, when you said earlier, uh, talking specifically about those, the settlements that you've been tracing as being these kind of, mm -hmm. I mean, frankly, insane shapes, you know, that seem to make no sense on their own. and. Um, I think those of us who have, who, have, who have traveled through the West Bank and have to go around them, they make even less sense on the ground um, as, you're, as you're moving, having to move around them. Um, but, you know, the use of those shapes, both as kind of these in this aesthetic way, right, that we're kind of allowed to kind of marvel at their, their beauty, but then there's, yeah, this kind of hidden meaning about their that biologic complexity is also somewhat insidious um, or can be seen as insidious the way it can morph and, and kind of take over in all these ways. Do we want to talk maybe about a few other contemporary artists as well who like Michelle are referencing different textile practices or works? Yeah, I, th I think it'd be great just to show a few images. I know it's getting later, but just to make sure that we touch on the contemporary artists, as you're saying, I, I can start just by briefly. Um, yeah, so this is an artist, um, Dor Guez, that um, Diana um, mentioned to me. I had been unaware of his work. He's um, referred to the actual biblical botany um, pages. Uh, and he has noted that they have, um, they faded. 
uh, over time. And without going into the, the whole process, uh, he is basically, he's creating these photographs where he's um, using the, the, uh, the color um, that's uh, transferred onto waxed paper uh, in combination with whatever color is left on the actual plant specimen. And that, so the, the one that appears to be quite white and small is um, he made these actual size and you can see that in the gallery shot, but then he also enlarged them uh, and used the blues um, that are reminiscent of cyanotype blues uh, in this photograph that he's, that he's blown up. But he's also talking about this idea of erasure of loss with the, the, the pigmentation being lost. And then um, to what um, Nisa was saying too about some of these uh, flowers um, being uh, uh, noted as being from certain areas, but not necessarily from them. So there is, you know, questioning what is, what is actual, uh, how you take this information, how do you sort of photograph it and register the, the difference, the, the time uh, how time has affected and changed um, these um, images. But I thought the work is really be uh, beautiful, I think. Uh, Deanna, I think you had some other images. I was just gonna say in relation to this one, Michelle, I was um, in seeing some of your in-process photos today and looking for instance, like the New Testament cover um, that your kind of experimentations with this you know, you're already experimenting with foil and reverse painting in particular ways, but that the fact that the objects, um, the kind of heirloom objects from your family are not pristine objects, that they are um, broken and fading, that has produced the, the kind of impetus for these new works in some sense. Like I, I, you know, I've looked at so many of these mother of pearl items and I, it's only in seeing your work how much I realized I was not appreciating the colored foil, <laughs> the background <laughs> foil at all. <laughs> totally <Yeah. laughs> but realizing through through um, the shots of your family objects, how you know you were you were more aware of that background foil because um, parts had come off, you know, because they were right. yeah. in pristine yeah. condition, and I think. In Dorguez's work, he's also right, recognizing how the flower petals, the coloration has faded with time and, and kind of using that to like peel back the layers on these initial objects. Yeah. It's beautiful. It's, yeah. So, but yeah, we, I know we brought in some other work. I, I'm, I feel like the New Visions Collective, I know Deanna, you were maybe going to talk about them, I think is so interesting for, for those who don't know about them. Um. Please. Yeah, this is sort of, you know, we were thinking about the way that Michelle uses sort of natural um, materials in, in her object, in her, in her work. Um, you know, when we were talking about that, it reminded me of, of um, the new vision. Um, uh, sorry, I have my nose somewhere. Um, the new vision um, artists and uh, these are a group of, so again, if we go back to the 1980s, these are a group of Palestinians, um, four artists, Nabil Anani, Tessia Barakat, uh, Vera Tamari, and um, um, Suleiman Mansour, who abandoned kind of sort of traditional or, you know, art supplies that you would use to create the artworks that they did. They were painters, they were sculptors, what have you, and um, really sort of decided to boycott um, art supplies and to return to the to the earth to their environment and use local materials to create this kind of artwork that is very um, you know sort of the, the one of the image on the left by Suleiman Mansour is is emblematic of the or representative of that kind of, of artwork he's using it's made of mud this is later in the 19, 1990s but this kind of artwork um, using these sort of materials from the land um, was started in in the late 80s and I think they were not just sort of doing this to, you know, as a sort of political act against the Israeli occupation, but I think they were also trying to break away from sort of traditional or expected art, exp artistic expression um, that was placed on Palestinian artists who had to be sort of committed artists, had to be, you know, um, presenting an, a particular kind of iconography or imagery of Palestinians um, and making sort of art as, as a political statement. And I think they were, but they were sort of pushing the boundaries of what was permitted or what was what could be possible. And I think that was also part of the general political um, 
atmosphere at the time in the late 80s during this intifada where you where it really was a popular uprising so you had the plo you had palestinian leadership outside of palestine um but what we had in with the intifada was a sort of um a, not abandonment of that leadership but sort of the, the a grassroots uh mobili you know mobilization of um, palestinians um taking matters into their own hands and sort of deciding how to address israeli occupation um, so everything was sort of being kind of questioned and deconstructed and, and, um, and so they were very much part of this, this, um, um, this sort of general milieu. So, but, you know, yeah, and then I think, you know, Michelle's work really does, you know, she's sort of using, again, these, you know, things that are very Palestinian, so to speak, but um, really reinterpreting them and using different kind of, interpreting them and expressing in a particular way that I find yeah, just very reminiscent of, of, of the of the works of, of these these four artists who are still you know uh, work live and working today and continue this 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 um, um, tradition of, of of art using you know natural materials that they find in their in their environment. Just as a side note, I mean we're seeing with the popular uprising you know of the last several weeks that the same you know the public is kind of calling these artistic strategies back to the fore. There's been so much discussion of the kind of new visions collective and the way that they use the boycott of Israeli um, materials to kind of come up with new ways to subvert um, Israeli oppression. And, you know, the, the, the figure of the watermelon, I don't I probably <laughs> get all into it um, today or I can in the Q and A, but, um, you know, we're seeing the watermelon come back up as a symbol of popular resistance. Um, a way to present the colors of the Palestinian flag without presenting a flag, um, green, black, and, and red, right? So visual artists are sometimes yeah. seen at the forefront of creating kind of strategies for political resistance. Um, Do you want to speak to the Mona Hatoum piece a little bit and Inash? Sure. Maybe if we could just go back just um, to the slide we were just on, just to say that um, I think we found these images uh, there are these artworks really compelling in relation to uh, Michelle's works, especially the second two, the last two series um, that you talked about, The Land of Milk and Honey and, and Stuck, and this way in which you're questioning the kind of, um, the question of borders and, and boundaries, and you talked about closed systems too, which now I'm kind of also thinking about the Sliman Mansour mud piece about a kind of closed system only ever shrinking and never expanding this kind of deeply um maybe even pessimistic kind of understanding of that or um i wanted to bring to the audience today this um this work by mona hatoum um which was uh, this is just a detail of it but it's a work done with cubes of olive oil soap from the region of nablus in the north of palestine that she then embedded these red glass beads into the surface of the soap um, in the shape of essentially the Palestinian territories as they were determined by the UN partition plans after 1948 and then again by the Oslo Accords in the 1990s. Um, and I've always seen that piece, you know, because soap as a material melts over time as kind of speaking to the, maybe the futility or the fragility of borders um, and maybe some hope there too that things will change, um, but maybe also yeah, futility in that you know, they're just gonna, you know, what's the point of all of these kind of politically made boundaries, um, which I also see uh, happening in Michelle's work, but in a very different way with this kind of, I mean, just the way you, um, you've created the paper in that stuck series using the gouache, um, wash at the end to watch the paper kind of crumple around these um, stuck pieces of mother of pearl land masses is such a, I don't know, just such a different experience um, but maybe speaking to similar, you know, very similar themes, I think. Um, so I love that there's that conversation, but through your very particular um, artistic practice that's happening. Um, but with these kind of, I, what I think of as kind of iconic works of contemporary Palestinian art from the last, you know, 30 to 40 years. And the last, the, the slide after this, I, I won't say much on because I know we're running out of time for Q&A, but um, just, just to note, I mean, we've talked a lot about textiles today and embroidery and just also how much I think these are still conversant in the realms of Palestinian art in terms of painting and installation work. Um, we kind of never 
see it fade um, because it's such a strong identifier or um, communicator of Palestinian identity. So um, both seeing it in the work of a kind of painting by Sliman Mansour on the left, um, really highlighting the women's garments and then another piece by Mona Hatoum on the right and that she did in cooperation with a, a kind of um, textile collective, women's textile collective to present these 12 different square roughly square fabrics as kind of different windows into the Palestinian experience that you can kind of use textiles to, to see these different types of experiences. So just more associations floating in our heads as we, as we look at Michelle's body of work that's on display. Thank you so much. Um, and maybe just a few thoughts in conclusion and I'll ask Michelle a question and we'll turn it over then to the audience because I certainly wanna make sure that we have time for questions. Um, we often here in the US kind of open our events now with this practice of giving land acknowledgements to recognize indigenous peoples who were stripped of their lands. So for example, in my case, I'm in Kansas, which is the ancestral territory of the Ka, Kikapu, Sioux and Shawnee peoples. So on the one hand, the recognition of violent acts and of dispossession and sort of the naming of people who sustain connections to homelands in spite of violence and continued erasure is a very important first step in acknowledging historical facts and addressing systematic oppression. But then also as we're weaving this practice of land acknowledgements into our practice, like how can we keep moving forward and advancing our attempt to kind of revise academic and curatorial and artistic practices from a decolonial perspective? And it's sort of an open-ended question to also just ask people to think about this you know, what do we mean when we're kind of trying to decolonize art and practices? And, you know, how do we think about Palestine in these and from this perspective as well? Um, you know, and for me, I'd say that Michelle's work has resonated with me very deeply as an incredibly beautiful and creative form of land recognition. You know, she offers a deeply personal account of settler colonialism and its impact on her family and through um, very material um, examples and, and her approaches to her work. Um, you know, her practice has really stimulated this rich discussion. And really this is um, just a fragment of some of the many things that we've been talking about over the last two months. And it continues to provoke many questions. And so Michelle, I don't know if you'd like to say a few words about your artistic practice as sort of opening pathways for discussion, but I also think too, this will be a great way to involve our audience. So, you know, um, yes. thank you. Just, just to thank, first of all, thank you so much for that. I really appreciate your, your kind words. Um, I just want to just want to say briefly that, um, you know, artists work in, we all work in different ways. Um, and in my case, I hope that my work is a catalyst for con uh, conversation um, about, uh, not only about how the redefinition of borders and boundaries has affected the Palestinians, but the millions of people um, around the world. That's one of the reasons why my initial title was looking for Palestine, but we changed it, I changed it to, um, uh, uh, mapping borders and boundaries because I wanted to um, acknowledge that other people, so many millions of people in the world um, have been de denied equal rights and the ability to claim a piece of the earth um, as their own and to live on it uh, peacefully and in self-determination. So I hope that this work has been a bit of a, uh, a catalyst for conversation around those issues. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. So we do have a question um, and a comment. Um, I'm struck that there are likely parallels with the art craft of other refugee cultures. Uh, the Hmong rapidly offered their Pandao tradition in both pattern and very detailed representations of traumas and journeys, which were then sold to help their early lives there. There must be other examples. I, you know, I, I, I don't know that I can um, speak to that specifically, but I think that is that goes to the point I was just making, that this is um, a universal issue. I mean, if you look just within our own country uh, at the um, Black, Indigenous, people of color, um, the, the fact that they have been denied access to land, that land has been taken from them, 
um, and that I, you know, there has been work, of course, that has been made in response to that. A lot of the work of Blacks in the South um, that we see and um, um, uh, Indigenous cultures in this country, um, but I, you know, I can't speak to it specifically, but it is obviously a universal issue. And, the, and art is such a, um, a wonderful universal vocabulary to be able to use to speak about some of these issues. And in some cases, as Nisa had pointed out earlier too, to, to um, actually um, make sometimes a living from that. Yeah, I do, I do find it interesting when there's that kind of question of agency of who's selling it. Um, mm -hmm. I know, Jessica, you, you done this work looking at um, Shoker in, in Lebanon and kind of who takes on the project to then promote this work or um, or kind of get it circulating I think is always an interesting second order question um, as well because yes I agree with um, the person who made the comment that there are certainly many examples that we have of this um, and then I, at least I personally am always interested in, in kind of who uh, also who is making it, but who's profiting off of it, because sometimes there's uh, many answers to that question. Absolutely. Um, and we have another question or request um, that's directed to you, Nisa. Um, looking at these biblical botanical pieces, I'd be curious to hear more about the divergence of art made in Palestine versus art made by Palestinians at this time, this transition between 20th and 21st centuries. Um, perhaps you or Diana could talk more about this, or maybe it will come up later. And so this was something that popped up in the chat um, that I'm sorry I didn't see during the conversation, but... Um, I'm not sure I uh, fully understand, but I'll do my best to, to answer. I love the this question of art made in Palestine versus art made by Palestinians, because that's something I think a lot about in the early 20th century period. Partially because, again, if you're looking at the souvenir market, um, there are certain instances where I think there's um, very little difference between what people are making and what their heritage is, um, especially for instance, in the realm of photography. Um, I find it very difficult to parse, you know, who is a French photographer um, in Palestine in 1901 taking photographs versus who is a um, Palestinian photographer, Armenian photographer, um, because there was such a kind of agreed upon language of what people wanted photographs to look like, especially if they were kind of biblical photographs, for instance. Um, at the same time that there were, I think, a lot of key differences um, between the works of, of Palestinians and those who were newly arrived in Palestine um, because they were kind of exploring a lot of um, what Palestinians were making and adapting their practices um, to what was already happening on the ground. So I guess, um, I kind of would answer that question both ways, but then the person is also asking about the transition between the 20th and 21st centuries. Um, and I guess I would just wanna say that I do think that um, uh, Palestinian artists in the early 20th century did think of themselves as Palestinian artists or crafts workers, um, even if it wasn't always in those terms, I think they felt them, you know, I, the identity was clearly Palestinian and they felt themselves as Palestinian artists in, in a similar way to those who, um, who think of themselves as Palestinian artists or identify as Palestinian artists in the 21st centuries. Um, but I'm not sure I fully understood the question, so apologies if I didn't um, get at the heart of it. Yes, please feel free um, to reach out to us. And um, we have another, um, attendee who's um, thanking us for an informative presentation. And uh, Michelle, thanks to you. Um, and is asking if you would once again, explain the mirror and reverse process of the land. I'd like to better understand this on the granular level. Um, I think maybe you're asking about the technical um, aspect of, of what I'm doing. Um, so, um, Reverse painting on glass uh, has a long history and uh, was particularly popular during the Victorian age, actually. But what it means is that when, when you look at those, the paintings, the colorful paintings, the surface is just, there's nothing on the surface of that plexiglass. Um, and they're plexiglass because they're so large. Um, it, um, they would be glass where they smaller. Um, so there's nothing on the surface. So, I'm painting behind uh, the glass 
um, with trans, uh, uh, translucent paint um, and um, in some cases, solid paint. What seems to sparkle there is actually a full layer of crumpled foil, aluminum foil that I've put against the backside after I've painted it. So the crumpled foil is reflecting the light. And I've done a lot of work with light boxes in the past. And one of the reasons that I started in my earlier work using this technique, because I was interested in finding a way that was less cumbersome and expensive than making light boxes for all of the work. And I remembered a painting that I had as a kid. Um, a, uh, it was a still life um, a tinsel painting from early 1900s. And I thought, oh, well, you know, that's a way of uh, refracting the light uh, without using a light box. Um, and so, as I mentioned before, it, you know, it's a nod to the uh, mother of pearl work that's backed with foil, but it's also um, a way of, um, in my mind, sort of making the work come alive because it does change uh, as you move around it because, uh, uh, because the light bounces off um, the foil and the surf and the paint in, in different ways. And it does go to this um, notion of um, movement of land. Um, and um, also this idea of mirroring is, um, you know, it's a way of looking at ourselves. And I think about that a lot too. It's just like, okay, take, take a look at what's happening. What's happening on one side uh, is also happening on the other side. You know, you have um, Palestine, that, I mean, Israel that was created um, because refugees needed um, a home. And the result of that was creating more refugees who, who also um, need a home. Uh, they've lost a home. So, you know, there are always, um, there's always more than one way um, to look at something and it's not uh, so binary. Uh, and I like that the foil and the mirroring contributes to that notion. The person who was asking the question would like to know a little bit more about this part of your process, which is on the screen right now with the, the map oh. of images being yeah. here. So, yeah, so technically all I did was I, um, I drew the shapes, the outlines of the shapes. And then I, I actually did this by hand and people who were comfortable using the computer think I'm crazy. Um, uh, I haven't gotten there yet with my Photoshop skills, but I also love holding a pencil. So I trace them and the, on tracing paper, and then I would flip them, uh, flip that over and trace the other side, creating a full image. And then I actually um, printed those on, um, uh, ran them through my copier on clear acetate, uh, put them on an overhead projector and projected them onto uh, paper the same size, the same scale as the paintings that I made. So I projected them, uh, drew them, then um, worked with a designer to um, prepare them to be uh, and to have vinyl cut. So I went to a, uh, a sign maker essentially. They cut the vinyl, which was put on the plexiglass. So I had a full sheet of cut vinyl with all the, the lines on it. And then one by one, I peeled off a piece of vinyl, exposing the plexiglass and I painted, peel off another one and paint it and so on. Um, it was a, certainly a step-by-step -step kind of labor intensive process. I'm sure that there are faster ways of doing it, but it, this worked for me. I hope that answers your question. We have a Bravo, so I believe oh, so. Thank you. <laughs> Maybe we'll take one um, final question from our audience uh, member who asks, do you think that there are specific aspects of the Palestinian struggle that influence the arts and crafts? thinking about the impact of claiming a crossroads as your home, successive colonization, and, and thanking us for this panel. I, you know, I think this, this question of, you know, the impact of claiming a crossroads as your home is so interesting because when we, when we think about Palestine as a kind of object of study or as a historical unit of study, it's really easy to see, um, to see it that way, um, that it's just kind of always been a place of, um, 
of war of people claiming ownership over it for religious or military purposes, et cetera. But um, I am not Palestinian. I didn't grow up in Palestine. So I'm um, speaking as someone who often sees it as a unit of study. But I think what I am always struck by in, in speaking with Palestinian artists or when I look at the work is just, again, how, how rooted it is and how actually non-concerned sometimes it is with those particular questions, um, that it is about um, home life, it's about um, what people grow up with. Um, when I think about the wildflowers or botany, I mean, when you're there in the spring, it's, it's just beautiful to see the hillside um, erupt with colors after a very dry and brown winter. Um, and then to see artists kind of be really inspired by those colors, by those forms, I often think of as, you know, a really deeply personal experience versus those biblical botanist missionaries that came um, and wanted to kind of study it as um, in reference to the Bible or the biblical history of Palestine. Um, so that's kind of my, my attempt at kind of understanding the fact that the arts and crafts don't always reference the struggle. Um, and, and of course, I think we mostly agree, right, shouldn't have to, but often it can be interpreted that way because of just where it's of where it's from and what histories it speaks to on a kind of uh, global historical level. Wow, this has been really, really incredible. I wanna thank everyone again for being here with us tonight, especially our panelists and Michelle for bringing us all together. Um, we are gonna have to wrap it up here but I would like to encourage um, anyone who can come and visit Fuller Craft Museum to come visit us to see Michelle's work. It will be on view through September 19th, 2021. Uh, we're open from Tuesdays through Sundays from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. And we are open. So we are doing some virtual programming, but we are open to the public um, as usual. Um, so I do hope that everyone can come see it in person. If not, you can view it on our website, which is fullercraft.org. And again, on behalf of my colleagues and everyone at Fuller Craft Museum, it's been a pleasure to have you here with us tonight and um, so much thanks.